Uh, thank you, Nadine. And good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon where you reside. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, Chair of the Archaeology Committee of the National Arts Club, and delighted to welcome today's audience to a fascinating lecture by Dr. W. Benson Harar, entitled How Napoleon Invented Egyptology with the Mother of All Coffee Table Books. Today's program is presented in collaboration with the American Research Center in Egypt's national headquarters and its New York chapter. The joint subjects Napoleon Bonaparte and Egypt have long fascinated many of us. The combination is extraordinarily potent. In 1796, the directory, formed after the fall of Robespierre two years earlier, offered for Napoleon to lead an invasion of England. Some believe the reason behind this request was that the five member board were apprehensive regarding his galvanizing presence in France. In emulation of Alexander the Great, General Napoleon Bonaparte instead pro proposed an invasion of Egypt. Two years later, with the aim of eliminating British dominance in India, which is of great concern to the French government, he departed for Egypt, accompanied by more than 150 savants. Amongst the extraordinary outcomes will be the discovery in 1799 by Pierre-Francois Bouchard of the Rosetta Stone, as well as beginning in 1809 until 1829, the publication by the Savants of their findings in the massive multi-volume descriptions de Egypt. The focus of Egyptology as a discipline has begun. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. William Benson Harar, adjunct professor of Egyptian art at California State University, San Bernardino. Famed lecturer, physician, scholar with degrees from Princeton University, and the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Harar is an acknowledged expert on Egyptian archeology span and history, as well as the generous donor of antiquities to the fortunate Brooklyn Museum with whom he excavated in Karnak, as well as to other famed institutions. Although he and I both served on Aussie's President's Advisory Council, we did not meet in person until we both participated in Aussie's King Tut 100 year anniversary tour. I have been exceedingly impressed with the breadth of Dr. Harar's knowledge and understanding of Egypt's dazzling past. Incidentally, I mentioned this trip previously. Our extraordinary leader, Professor Nozuma Kawai from Japan's Karazawa University gave a splendid virtual presentation about the reign of Tukutkamen, the beginning of John and Colleen Darnell's remarkable talk, When Ignatan and Nefertiti Were Gods on Earth, features a short video I took in Egypt, during which you can briefly view Ben from the back at the festive Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities sponsored November 4th celebration held at the Temple of Luxor. Links to these programs, as well as to the fascinating Renewing Amana from Saqqara by the eminent French Egyptologist Alain Zilli can all be found on, Q and, on chat, but please leave your queries on Q&A instead. It is now my privilege to request that Dr. Harar addresses our audience. Ben, if you will. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And we're going to start the talk in 1799, when Napoleon has returned to Paris, having just conquered Italy. He has a 20,000 man army that are fanatically loyal. The committee which is running the revolution is very wary of him because they realize that this ambitious young man could take over the government if he chose. So they suggest he go invade in England and he gives it a little thought and decides instead he will go invade Egypt. 
If he does that, he can control the Isthmus Canal right here and prevent British shipping from India to go through the Mediterranean. That would be enormously costly for them to have to send everything around the Horn of Africa. In addition, he will make Egypt a colony and exploit it for the benefit of France. Now, I went to, to meet Napoleon's best friend, Vivant Danon. He is 21 years older than Napoleon. He is an artist, a lawyer, a playwright. He has written a, an erotic novel under an assumed name, and he is a favorite of the king in the court. So much a favorite that the king sends him off to Italy on a diplomatic mission. And while he is in Italy, a funny thing happens back in Paris, the French Revolution. Danon is denounced, tried in absentia, and sentenced to death at the guillotine. Now to show you the kind of man he is, when he hears this, he immediately rushes back to Paris and demands a retrial where he can defend himself. And he convinces them, number one, he is not an aristocrat. And number two, he is a loyal citizen who deserves to play his role in forming the new republic. <clears throat> So here's Napoleon's plan for Egypt. He is going to exploit it, but nobody knows what there is to exploit. So in order to find out, he hires five of the leading scientists to form a commission of science and the arts who can study the country, learn all about it, and maximize its benefit to France. And these five men, uh, Saint-Hilaire, Dolomieu, Ben Hollet, Fournay, and Monge, are the key who recruit everything, everybody else to be the, uh, the commission who later become known as the savants. Curiously enough, only three of these know the ones that with the asterisk, only these three know what the actual destination is. And it's remarkable that these people would sign up to go off to an unknown place for an unknown length of time to study with whatever their skills were. And this is sort of charisma that Napoleon had that he could do this. So his five conscripted a total of 151 civilians. It included two astronomers, eight artists, and they were the equivalent of photographers of today. And they were mainly architects, engineers, surveyors, and the, their students. Curiously, the largest single op occupational group was 27 of these, who he wanted so badly they let three of them bring their wives so they would come. Now, if we had a live audience, I would offer a chocolate almond bar to somebody who could tell me what that occupation was. But it's hard to build suspense with Zoom, so I'm just going to tell you, they were printers. Napoleon had a very clear understanding of the value of propaganda and the printed word. So he had 27 printers so that he could put out even daily bulletins if he wished. <clears throat> so he finally assembles a flotilla of 330 ships to carry all of his troops and the Samans to Egypt. Miraculously, they make the journey without being caught by the British Navy, and they land safely at Abukir Harbor on the 1st of July, 1798. <clears throat> For the first time, Napoleon gets to see a camel and ride on one, decides he likes horses better. Now, the, Egypt is run by the Mamluks, even though it's part of the Ottoman Empire, and the Mamluks are a warrior caste uh, sort of like samurai, uh, who uh, recruit young men at an early age and train them to be fighters. They are skilled horsemen. They fight with lances and, and swords. And they, of course, resent no Napoleon's coming in. So they rally together, and there's a pitched battle at the pyramids. And while they, the Mamluks, were very fierce fighters. There were no match for the cannons and muskets of the French. 
So it was a disaster. The, there's only one of the important ones, Murad Bey, who escaped with 3,000 of his fighters. So in less than a month, Napoleon could sit on the, the Cotton Hills, look out over Egypt, and think that he had done it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, out on the ocean, the British Navy has been scouring, looking for the French. They are led by General Horatio Nelson, who is a brilliant commander. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. On the afternoon of 1 August, as the sun is setting, the British fleet rounds the corner into Abakir Bay. And to see the French fleet easily lined up here, and Nelson makes a brilliant decision to attack immediately, even though it's getting dark. Now, this was particularly brilliant because Nelson didn't know it, but one third of the French soldiers were off on leave in Cairo sightseeing, and the French admiral, expecting any fight would come from the sea, had very foolishly batted down all the gun ports on the landward side, so they were not prepared at all for an attack. Since it's changed history, I will mention a bit more about this particular battle. Nelson very cleverly sent five of his ships down the landward side and engaged the rest from the seaward side. And <coughs> excuse me. When the battle raged on for hours in the night, sometime a little after midnight. The Orient, which was Napoleon's flagship, caught fire. And when the fire hit the powder kegs, it blew up with an explosion that was heard in Cairo, 150 miles away. This was a disaster for Napoleon in many respects. His entire treasury had been on the Orient, so all the gold that he had brought for bribes and purchases was gone. His ammunition was gone because it had been on the ships. And the savants, instruments, most of them were still on the Orient. So it was a disaster. Napoleon realized his entire campaign had been killed in that day. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me introduce Nicholas Conti. He is a genius. He's an artist, a balloonist who lost his eye trying to create hydrogen for a balloon. He is a inventor. He invented the lead pencil, which was, was a boon for the savants so that they didn't have to worry about uh, carrying ink and sharpening quilled pens in order to make on their notes. He invented the semaphore code, which for a while gave Napoleon a nice advantage in his military campaigns. He was also a manufacturer. We might consider him the equivalent of Ben Franklin of France. Conti came to the rescue. He immediately set up a factory to produce ammunition. Napoleon was down to having only two shots per man in his army. And Conti was able to set up factories which provided all the ammunition for the rest of the campaign. In addition, he remanufactured the instruments for the savants and improved on the design in many cases. So let's have a quick recap of one month in Egypt. Land of the 1st of July, Battle of the Pyramids, the 24th of July, then the naval disaster in Abukir on the 1st of August. So Napoleon knew he was stuck, but he'd have to make the best of it. So he sent General Dessay to pursue Murad Bay from Lower Egypt to Upper Egypt, and 
the bay led him on a merry chase, marching his troops over 5,000 miles and getting back and forth between August and June of 1788 to 1799. <clears throat> Denon convinces Napoleon he should be allowed to go with the say he wants to see more of the country. Now, Denon has to say with the army because uh, he is strictly a tag along, but he takes the opportunity to copy everything he can, what he can. And this is a salt portrait of him working uh, on, well, he is with to say. Now, Napoleon then decides as long as he's there, he might as well conquer the Holy Land. So he marches his army up the coast and he gets as far as Acre with only minor skirmishes. And then he is stymied. The, uh, the defenders will not come out and fight. He is not strong enough to take the, the city with the frontal assault. And he can't waste the time for a siege. So he does the only intelligent thing. He declares mission accomplished and makes a triumphal return to Cairo on the 14th of June, 1799. Now, meanwhile, the caliph back in uh, Constantinople is upset with what uh, this upstart Frenchman is doing. So he sends a 30,000 man army to Abu Kir to get rid of Napoleon. But what happens? Napoleon learns about it and he gets his troops there in time to get and confront them as they're landing. And it is an utter rout for the Ottomans. Thousands are killed or drowned trying to get back to their boat. And Napoleon is totally triumphant, but he only loses a handful of men. But during that battle, there are two English officers who were there as observers with the Ottoman army. And Napoleon talked with them and gets his first news from Paris and finds that the revolution is not going well. <clears throat> so he decides they need him. So it's time for him to go back to Paris. He does this more stealthily than he did the arrival in Egypt. He leaves in the middle of the night in a small boat with only Danon, Monge, and Berkeley. He doesn't even tell his second in command that, command that he's going. General Baptiste Clover, Kleber, who is second in command, learns about it when he finds a letter from Napoleon in the morning. And his last orders are, Kleber should arrange an honorable dis withdrawal for the army, and the savants should study Upper Egypt and leave when the work is finished to their satisfaction. So Napoleon returns to Paris, where he is hailed as a hero, and he proceeds to start taking over the French government. <clears throat> Excuse me. The line becomes the chosen of town. He is as much in demand as a portrait artist. He republishes his erotic novel under his own name, and he writes a book of his adventures, a voyage to Upper and Lower Egypt. And this is translated into English very rapidly, and it is wildly popular. In fact, there are 20 printings of it before the first issue of the description to the sheep actually comes out. Now, I want to uh, show you the challenge that engravers had at this time. The skies in Egypt were always cloudless, and it changed from a very intense blue at the top to very light at the bottom. And this was an extraordinary challenge for the, the engravers to do. This is the French, the English edition, sorry. And <coughs> meanwhile, back in Egypt, 
the Commission of Science and the Arts Board for the Institute to Jeep with 48 members, which they include Napoleon, Kleber, and a couple of the generals. And they study Alexandria and Cairo until July of 1799. And then Kleber is the first to suggest that they publish a book for the general public to be called The Description of the Sheep. On the 29th of December, 1799, 15 members form a joint stock commission to publish and share profits. Then, then they go off to study Upper Egypt following Danon's report. <clears throat> so they assiduously measure all the monu monuments. They do surveying, they reconstruct things as they would be in ancient times. They study the manners and customs of the local people. They study the irrigation system that the country has. They collect all the fish that they can from the Nile. They collect every animal that they find. They shoot birds and stuff them so that they can have samples of everyone. They press, dry and press plants, and of course document them. Now I want you to meet General Jean-Baptiste Kleber. He is a worthy successor to Napoleon. His men love him, and he is intensely respected. And so while the, the supplies are traveling south with the army up scored, Claiborne necessarily negotiates an honorable dis withdrawal with the truth of our reach on the 28th of January, 1800. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, but even though uh, the British government uh, honored the truth. The British Navy refuses to honor it and denies some safe passage. And while this is happening, the Caleb decides he's really going to put an end to the French. He sends a 60,000 man army to drive out the French. Now, if Napoleon gave an inspiring speech before the Battle of the Pyramids, Claver must have done equally well before the Battle of Heliopolis, because on the 20th of March, 1800, even though they were outmanned more than three to one, Kleber led his men to a stunning victory over the Ottoman army. Following the Battle of the Heliopolis, Kleber decided he would simply occupy the Delta until he could get recognition of the treaty by the British Navy. And unfortunately, on the 14th of June, 1800, he was assassinated. The command then fell to General Jacques Francois Manu. He was a very different person. He had fallen in love with Egypt. He didn't care if he ever went back to France. He had converted to Islam and changed his name to Abdullah. And in addition, he had married a Muslim woman who was the daughter of the Cairo bathhouse operator. <laughs> now, the French were just appalled with all this. The British had a big laugh over it and thought it was ridiculous. The Egyptians were unimpressed. After all, who wouldn't convert to Islam once they heard about it? And here he is the most powerful man in this area. He should be marrying a wife from the family of one of the leading imams and another one from the family of one of the, the leading um, bays. And then if he wanted a playmate, the Cairo bathhouse girl would be fine. So the net result was Manu got no respect from anybody. So meanwhile, this was slavery on. They did, <coughs> sorry. They did extensive surveying of sites. 
they depicted the sites that they visited, which were heavily ruined or were filled with sand. They showed as they were. When they could, they showed the whole thing as it would have been in the ancient times. <clears throat> they did color coding of their black and white drawings uh, so that they could reproduce them accurately when they got home. They collected all the bats and everything that flew. They collected more birds and they studied the skeletons of them. They did a little study of mummies. They collected a lot of antiquities and a lot of scarabs and amulets. They also got samples of their pottery, both modern and ancient. Now, the end was coming for Manu. He finally was forced to fight the Ottomans at the Battle of Canopus on the 21st of March, 1801. And this time, the Caliph brought in 17,000 British regulars to fight the, the French, and they knew how to fight them. And it was a disaster. The French army was split in two. The northern half holed up in Cairo at the Citadel with the Cairo Salons, and they were under General Belliard, and he was very well respected by everybody. And he was actually able to convince the British Navy to let them leave with full honors of war. And they departed on the 27th of June in 1801. Meanwhile, Manu was hunkled down in Alexandria and the Samants have had it. They want to go home. So they hired a merchant ship and put all their stuff on it and get set to go back to Paris. But Manu is outraged by this, so he tells them if they host the sails, he will sink their ship with them, them on it. Not only that, he will let them back off the ship. So they're essentially in jail on the ship for four weeks before he finally relents and lets them disembark. Meanwhile, the situation is steadily deteriorating. And on the 3rd of September, Manu realized it would be futile to try any kind of fight, and he totally capitulates. The British then claim all the savants' collections, and Manu, who has no love lost for them, readily agrees. The savants go ballistic led by Jeffrey Sotelier, who was just in his 20s. They bypass Manu, negotiate with the British, tell them that they don't want barrels of pickled snakes and boxes full of insects and hundreds of pounds of rocks and seashells. So the British agree and say they will just settle for a few souvenirs. So they'll take the Rosetta Stone but they're very nice about it. They let the Samoans make six different rubbings of it so that they can have an accurate publication in their book. They take the fist from the colossal statue of Ramses II. They take a number of papyri and the statue base from Abydos. So, <laughs> Oh. The Savants finally get back to Paris. And when Napoleon learns about the publication, he abolishes the stock company and says the government will take it over. He decides that the contributors will be paid for what they put in, and he will have a committee to peer review submissions to make sure the validity of everything. And this is one of the early examples a peer review for scientific publication. He appoints Conti editor-in-chief, and Conti unfortunately passes away after two years. Then Land Cray takes over and only lives another two years. And finally, Jamard sees it through to the conclusion in 1828. 
Meanwhile, Danone is now a veteran, thanks to Napoleon the Emperor, and still a favorite of Napoleon. He has become the director of all museums in France. He is the first director of the Louvre. He is, uh, uh, <coughs> republishes his erotic novel in his own name uh, with great success. And he is a renowned artist and standard setter for society. He is also a very strong supporter of the, of the Simones. To top it off, he apparently becomes the lover of the Empress Josephine because the poet is very busy with the string of mistresses. <coughs> now the challenges for the, the Simones it must be a quality worthy of Napoleon. It has to have a scope that is absolutely comprehensive. And it is in size, it will be the biggest publication anybody ever made. There will be 10 plate volumes and two texts. They will use the largest copper plates ever made. <coughs> they will use the largest sheets of paper ever made. But if you have perhaps thousands of benches, this will require 80 to 100 master engravers. They finally end up with 837 plates with 80 to 100 sheets of paper. 80,000 of these are watercolored by hand by children, and they have a run of a thousand copies by four different printers. They use four grades of paper. Uh, <coughs> Just to give you an idea of the size of these, this lady is five feet ten, and this is a big sheet of paper, so big that there wasn't a press available large enough to print them. So they had to totally redo the higher entire industry just to print this book. When they could, they reconstructed a, a, an object as it would have been in ancient time and showed the ancient costumed people. This is a base where you can see the Egyptian procession. And others, they showed themselves. In this, you see one of the savants coming to look at the, the scene. And we have natives having a little barbecue by the temple. Uh, here is another savant coming in from the other side with his rolling board. And of course, they always had the army protecting them. Now the plates are signed by the artist on the left and by the engraver on the right. This is a scene from Denant's book. And it's a challenge to get the sky right to show it deep at the top and light at the bottom. And it took a master engraver months to do just this one case from Port of Vaughan. So, Monty realized that this was being like building a cathedral. No one would live long enough to see it published. So he came to the rescue again. He invented an engraving machine, which would give you a sky like this, which really reflected the way it was from dark at the top, gradually getting light at the bottom and do it with great accuracy. And <laughs> sorry, at any rate, as the editor, uh, and he saved, he invented this engraving machine, and it cut the time to produce a plate by more than 90%, so that it became a practical thing to actually accomplish. And you can see this little detail from one of the earlier plates I showed you, how he had seven different engraving patterns to give different effects just in this little area. 
and it was just a godsend for them. The first volume with much urging from Napoleon came out in 1809. This was a premise piece. There were 97 plates and four quality grays and uh, 67 were colored, as I mentioned. And they had color coded the scenes on the walls so that they could duplicate them when they printed them back in Paris. They also showed <laughs> scenes which have since disappeared. This was the birth of Cleopatra, and it was at Armont, and the temple was dismantled, and the box used to build a sugar factory somewhere. So someday it may resurface. Uh, <clears throat> So the Antiquities volume came out one to five. The Modern Egypt was two volumes. The Natural History was two volumes. And these came out from 1809 to 1822. The maps weren't published until 1828 because they were military intelligence. And the, whoops. Okay, uh, the uh, modern Egypt plates for the second volume came out in 1817, but the texts were published in 1812 and 1822. The natural history volume, the first volume, of course, was in 1809, but the second volume, the text came out in 1813, and the plates half in 1817, and half in 1824. So it was a, a mixed bag getting them all together. The maps, which were published in 1828, are totally bogus. They would give a re an idea of what the Delta was like. It would be absolutely worthless for anybody who wanted to try to use them to navigate. Now, the demand was so great for this that a second edition was published before the first one was finished. And it was done by C.L. Pancock. And he was a very efficient painter, a printer rather. And he published these between 1801 and 1829. <coughs> and it was in 37 parts. It was dedicated to Louis XVIII where the first one was dedicated to Napoleon. <clears throat> this is the first front piece on the left, the second front piece on the right. And for the second edition, this front piece is the only one that was decorated. He produced a special cabinet, gold at all, and one of these recently sold a few years ago for over a million dollars. Now, if you want to know whether you have a first or second edition, you have to look at the upper right-hand corner. This is a first edition plate. You can see embossing from the plate, but otherwise it's plain. A second edition plate will have an embossed stamp of the Sphinx, which you see right here, as that's how to tell the two apart. So the result of all this was Egyptomania, exploration, exploitation, imitation, and collection, and the birth of a new genre of art, the Orientalists, which I am very fond of. And finally, Egyptology, word for the mother of all coffee table books, the description de l'Egypte, courtesy of Napoleon Bonaparte, with a little help from Louis the Eighteenth after 1815. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to try to handle questions. Okay. Yes, start my video. But
Thank you, Ben. It's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to learn from you. And I've enjoyed this thoroughly, your images and your uh, wisdom, giving us the facts of the past and tying it all together. Um, I want to remind our audience to put their questions into Q&A, and I'm going to begin with two questions from the Archaeology Committee. Did Now, the first comes from Wynne Mayakol, my assistant chair. Did Napoleon continue his interest in Egyptian religion after he returned to France? So I didn't quite get that all after his return to France. And and was he still interested in Egyptology? Uh, yes, he was. And when he learned about the their plan to publish a book, he immediately wanted it to be his. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my second is connected with the first, in a sense. How much of Napoleon's addition of numerous scientists, researchers, and archaeologists to his Mideast campaign was motivated by Enlightenment values? And how much is propaganda? to hide his desire to increase his power. And that's from Jody on the committee. Well, I think he wanted to exploit both as much as he could. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I could give any proportional answer to that, but I'm sure he would take it to as far as it would go for him. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you, Ben, much to my amazement, we have very few questions. You have included so much and gave many of our listeners much to think about because <laughs> you were so solid in the way you handled the past. And so the audience knows Ben even doesn't feel up to par. And yet this has been an amazing talk. And I've gotten comments that thank you very much for your fascinating um talk itself. Now, the question is, where are the books now? So Anonymous wrote down, I know someone whose family owns a book set. Where are all the books? Are they on in the major libraries around the world? Um, the museums, collectors of Egyptology? Uh, they're scattered. Uh, many have been broken apart and sold by dealers as individual plates. The, uh, the first 50 were taken by Napoleon and he wanted to give them to foreign governments, a copy to the Vatican or to uh, the King of England or uh, equivalent. Uh, I think we have one in the, uh, in the Smithsonian now, uh, mm -hmm. but the, there are, Occasional, like, uh, universities usually got them. The, the example that I showed, the Pancooks that sold for over a million dollars was from one of the British universities that sold it. And several of the universities in England have them. And the Louvre currently has all the plates and has periodically displayed some of them. Mm -hmm. In fact, in on drew crowds displaying them all when it was first published. Mm -hmm. uh, someone just said she has two plates and they're signed by Joe Maud. And they are embossed with a, a Sphinx seal. Are they the second edition? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I had a little trouble. Uh, someone says she has two plates from volume five. Yes. Um, if, she, if she wants to know whether it's the first or second edition, yeah. she has to look at the upper right-hand corner. Which is what if you there's said. an embossed stamp, it's the second edition. If it's plain, it's the first edition. But most of the plates now are sold individually. Uh, dealers have broken them up and have made a lot of money selling the individual plates. It's very interesting. Um, 
Ben, when the British had their decisive naval victory, did they try to go on land to actually conquer the savants? Were they, someone was curious, or were they left alone? Uh, let me clarify that. Was Napoleon want to conquer the? Did the British want to conquer the savants? Did they want to capture them? Is the uh, way of interpreting this question. No. The, the British treated the savants very well. They were not military. They were not part of the army. They were totally independent. And the British treated them as such and, and were indeed very nice to them. In fact, even five years after they were back, they let Jamard come to England and take yet another rubbing of the Rosetta Stone so that their publication would be absolutely accurate. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know that at one point there's starting of a French Institute of Archaeology and someone asked a question about the French works on the mummies in ancient Egypt. They actually did very little. Uh, they uncovered some and took pictures, but they did no analysis. Uh, and unfortunately, it was the fashion at the time to study skulls. So later people came in and ripped the skulls off mummies to study them uh, separately. Uh, phrenology, the study of the shape of the skull was somehow telling you what was inside, uh, was very popular. And that was unfortunate because a lot of mummies were disrupted just for that. I have to say, um, when I was in the Egyptian museum, my husband's a neurologist, and a lot of you have seen Gordon on the program, so I've mentioned him. And I asked Gordon, is there anything he could tell me about the, the pharaohs? from the shape of their skulls, but we saw them only wrapped. It's not quite the same thing as analysis, unfortunately. Um, so. Now, well, I, mean, oh, I, don't yeah. think, I don't think you can learn anything from the shape of the skull. Champollion, uh, did he had access to the tracings from the Rosetta Stone? I know the Rosetta Stone is in the British Museum. They, they, they took rubbings, they put a sheet of paper over it and then rubbed it with, uh, I guess, charcoal, which would make a, uh, an impression and copy the hieroglyphs. Someone asked also about astronomy. Um, and I know that the Egyptians were very interested in astronomy. Did the Safans learn anything directly from the Egyptians' knowledge or not? About constellations? Well, we're, we're talking about what the astronomers did. Yes, who were the Savants? Yeah. Who were well, uh, yes. The Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, were uh, very, very good astronomers, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was important for them to be able to count the hours of the night. And so they had techniques uh, to measure that, uh, sometimes with a, a water clock that dripped at a certain amount, or uh, using special types of staffs, which they could track stars moving across the sky and know when an hour had passed. Mm -hmm. So this is very important for them. Okay. A number of people, <laughs> thank you, Ben. Um, a number of people are curious, is it possible to actually see the volumes? Are there any in New York, Columbia, the Metropolitan? Would you know the New York Public Library? The Brooklyn. Uh, I imagine the New York Public Library has a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Oil Institute has. Uh, 
I know the University of Pennsylvania has some, but I don't know whether they have it all. Princeton has a large collection. In fact, Princeton, I think, has a complete collection. Mm -hmm. And they published a very nice volume about it. And are the facsimiles available? Yes. I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Tashin has produced a complete facsimile for only $25. It's an amazing bargain. So I recommend anybody who wants to see the whole thing buy the Tashin volume. Really? That's wonderful to know. I'm going to try to get that myself. I think that's excellent news. Yes, it's excellent. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that we can continue with this knowledge from the um, books because they have so much to offer. Now, I came across, and this is not what the, the Savants and the books, but there are many different versions of the quote about Napoleon. 20 centuries looking down upon you when he's places. What exactly? I've seen three different translations of the Napoleon quote. Ben, if you know the one I'm talking about. When he says from... The pyramids. Well, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of really accurate quotes. We know he gave a very stirring speech to his troops when yes. they had the first battle at the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And he told them that history was watching them. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anybody that's, recorded. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, actual detail. I, yeah, different versions of that. Um. Another question, which is interesting, and there were so many of these, is what books would you recommend besides the facsimile from Tashin that is available that we can know the, more about this subject? You've had Princeton, these articles also? The Princeton publication is excellent, and it gives a lot of historical perspective about the uh, the production. So I would highly recommend that. It's in two volumes. And uh, but that and the Tasha would be my my first choices. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm noting these for myself even, because I'd like to know more about it after the talk, because it's something we've all heard about without having specific knowledge. And you've given us so much information today, which well, is great. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's been my pleasure to quote through it. I apologize for the fact that I've had these quabbing episodes that have interfered with the flow, but I think we made it. I think we did terrifically. And I just want to thank you again. And, you know, the audience, and we have a global audience today. I can only reiterate what I said early. It was a treat to travel along with Ben on this trip through Egypt, because he's a fount of knowledge, as you've all heard. I'd like to thank the club for putting this online. And also, yeah. our next program is live, yeah. and it will be June 18th. A member of our committee, Patricia Koreski, is going to be talking on the desecration of Chinese art. So for those in the New York vicinity, I look forward to seeing you then.